the Kinesis Mental Physics, uh, like high TC superconductor, and also gauge gravity duality. Uh, today, Philip will tell us his recent theory on superconductor and uh, mountains, uh, based on some exact solved model. Uh, let's welcome Philip. Uh, Philip, please. Uh, thank you very much. I uh, have to apologize. Um, I didn't read the email very closely, and I thought it was 10.30 my time, and but it's actually 10.30 your time. So, uh, okay. So I'm going to talk about this work, which was just published in Nature Physics. My collaborators are one of my students, Luke Yale, and then Edwin Huang, a uh, postdoc. And there's a comment, there's a news and views on it by Jan Zanen. So I'm going to put together two things which are on people's minds who work on this topic. How do you derive superconductivity from a Mott insulator? And is there an exact, any, are any statements that you could make exact? Okay, so let me just review uh, BCS theory. For, um, I think I have to do this, yes. So superconductivity is a very old problem. It started back in uh, 1911, and the resistivity goes to zero. The first, under, the first sort of inkling as to what might be going on is the Cooper instability. And this starts with a Fermi surface, a collection of electrons which are essentially free. The, sen the sense in which they are free I will talk about in a few minutes. But what Cooper did is he turned on an attractive interaction between two electrons outside the Fermi surface. And what he found is this situation is unstable. They want to condense into a pair below the Fermi surface. Of course, there are no states below the Fermi surface. So what this ultimately is telling you, there's some sort of essential singularity and there's a condensate that wants to form and has a well-defined amplitude and a phase. Now it's, understood now that although Cooper just included this interaction, this statement of his is much more general. And we understand this in the following way. A Fermi liquid is a state of matter in which if you were to turn on repulsions that are short range, for example, the states which you would end up with over here are in a one-to-one -one correspondence with those of the non-interacting system. They have the same index. Momentum is still a valid quantum number. So they stand in a one-to-one -one correspondence. And if they stand in a one-to-one -one correspondence, this is really all you have to worry about. So all of these are renormalizing to zero. So you can say then this, repul this repulsion is irrelevant. Um, what BCS did is considered an instability where the interaction is between electrons on opposite sides of the Fermi surface. And this is the only interaction which is relevant, which takes you away from this non-interacting or um, weakly interacting ground state, and you end up with a, with a superconductor. The key number in BCS is that two delta over TC is 3.5. So the amplitude over TC is this universal number. So it's independent of the strength of the uh, attractive interaction. Okay, so let's look and see where BCS put us. We start with the Fermi gas, uh, Fermi liquid. Uh, we have certain quasi-particle excitations. Uh, BCS tells us that if you turn on this interaction, this whole thing condenses. And the question I ask is, is there anything else in this evolutionary process? Uh, the key question I ask is, what is the terminus of this evolutionary process? So is there physics beyond BCS? If there's physics beyond BCS, then there has to be some type of fixed point that is beyond Fermi liquid theory. Okay, we suspect that that is the case because the cuprates are very different. They don't start off their lives as Fermi liquids, they start off their lives as Mott insulators. And um, there are many examples of Mott insulators. The key point about Mott insulators is that you open a gap at the chemical potential with no change in the size of the Brillouin zone. And that will be uh, very important in a few minutes. So if there's no change in the size of the Brillouin zone, 
Um, this offers some sort of uh, disconnect for many. And um, in certain settings, um, it's actually fairly easy to come up with a MOT insulator. Uh, for example, if you just have a charged black hole and you have an ADS background and you have charges outside the horizon, the problem of infall into the horizon can just be viewed as a MOT insulating kind of problem. So it's a competition between the, the attractive force of gravity and the repulsive force uh, between these charges. If Q is bigger than QC, some critical value, um, things stay outside. If they don't, they fall inwards. And the infall into a black hole can be viewed as a MOT insulator. So there are no conducting charges in the system. So if you were to go and calculate a boundary propagators, you would just obtain gap degrees of freedom. So perhaps what Mott had in mind is that uh, we should just think about this problem holographically, and then there's no controversy. Of course, that's not what Mott had in mind, although this is a very nice picture. Um, this is what Mott had in mind. And so in the condensed matter community, this, this statement of Mott is still viewed as controversial, because what you're trying to do is generate a gap and you generate lower and upper Hubbard bands, and I'll say what I mean by those precisely in a few minutes, uh, when U is bigger than some, some value. Now, the only dimension we know to solve this problem in is one dimension. But what is relevant for the cuprates is at least solving this model, since this is the model which is accepted in the community is giving us a Mott insulator. Um, uh, so we have to solve this in at least two dimensions. Okay, so what we have to do is solve the Hubbard model. Well, that's no small feat. We can only do this in one dimension. And everyone knows that we need to carry out the BCS program. We need to go and illustrate there's a Cooper instability in this strongly interacting model. Since I think it's agreed that the charge carriers in the superconducting state are still 2E. Um, so what has the progress been so far? Well, this is an extremely difficult problem. Everyone knows this is the program you have to carry out. Uh, in terms of solving the Hubbard model, there are several approaches which have been used, uh, DMFT, Quantum Monte Carlo, and there have been lots of disputes. So the, a dispute which has been central to my thinking about this problem uh, took place quite some time ago. And let me just review this dispute. Uh, sorry for those of you who know this dispute well, but I'm the one giving the talk, so I'll tell you how I began to think about this problem. Okay, it's, a, it's a dispute between Laughlin and Anderson. And uh, what Laughlin is doing is excoriating the whole field for ever talking about Mott insulation. Um, because as he, he has a bunch of statements which begin with nowhere, nowhere, Nowhere can one find precise definitions of Mott insulator terminology. The upper and lower Hubbard bands, for example, are vague analogs of the valence and conduction bands of a semiconductor, uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and hence, if we can't talk about this exactly in a precise sense, you can substitute exact for precise, um, then we aren't talking about anything. On the other hand lies Phil Anderson, who wrote a critique of a critique of two metals. And he starts off by saying 10 years of the best minds in theoretical physics have failed to uh, come up with any formal dem demonstration of Mott insulation. And then he says the statement would be ludicrous if it were not so influential. Um, he also says that it's a tragedy of Mott that although he most certainly won his Nobel Prize for the Mott insulator, Slater, who couldn't think clearly about the finite temperature problem, won the publicity battle. Okay, it's this comment here which hides the real truth of what's going on okay so this is laughlin's objection um we're trying to get a gap without breaking any symmetry and he's saying very uh correctly um this has not been demonstrated certainly in the hubbard model in 2d now if this were to be demonstrated why would this be significant it would be significant because you'd be starting from a non-interacting band in which there's just one state at every, which the spectral weight of every state in momentum space 
is just carried locally here. But now you'd be splintering each K state into spectral weight at high and low energies, which means you'd be breaking this one to one correspondence. In fact, you'd be going to a one to two correspondence. And what he's saying is this has not been demonstrated. So my this controversy influenced me because I decided, well, if the, these are two very smart people, they're obviously debating something which is not settled. So I decided to ask the question, what is really the difference between Laughlin and Anderson? Um, there might be other differences, but the one I focused on is uh, the difference is Mottness. That if, in fact, Mott insulation is not reducible to what Laughlin was talking about, then there has to be some further fact that one has to delineate. And the question I asked is, is can you delineate that in a quantitative way? And it turns out you can. And it's this issue of zeros and the quantity which uh, dis which makes which discerns the difference between them is if you compute the determinant of the real party of the green function. For Laughlin, this is entirely non-zero. For Anderson, this is equal to zero. Okay, so to introduce this, let me just do a counting of particles. And I'll show you how the determinant of the real part of the green function uh, factors into this counting of particles. So it's very simple to count particles. You just put numbers on them. Um, but that's very tedious. So is there a more efficient way of counting particles? And luckily that there is, is this famous theorem due to Luttinger. And what he says is, you don't have to go and look at everyone. You do in a, in a different sense of it though. Um, since they have spin, there's a factor of two here. You see, and this is the heavy side step function. All you do is integrate over the locus of points in momentum space, where the real part of the green function with mega equals zero, we're interested in low energy, is positive. Okay, why does that work? Well, if your green function looks like this, in the vicinity of every quasi-particle excitation, that green function will change sign. And hence, if you simply count the number of positive sign changes of the green function, um, assuming the green function looks like this, you'll be effectively counting the number of quasi-particles in the system. And two gives you the degeneracy. Okay, so this is counting poles. Now, written in this form, the, this theorem only cares about what the sign of the green function is. It doesn't care about the mechanism by which the green function became positive. For example, you could have a zero crossing and that's included in here. And mathematically it is because ultimately this is tied to the singularities of log G and log G is singular, both when G is equal to zero and G is equal to infinity. G is equal to infinity corresponds to this, G equals zero corresponds to zero crossings. And that's why both of them are present here. But that's a level of detail which is not necessary here. Okay, so here they are. Now, if your green function looks like this, it can never go through a zero. So clearly, this other mechanism of zeros is beyond this uh, simple form of a green function. Okay, so let's think about um, where zeros come from. So, according to Mott, the imaginary part of the green function looks like this. Now, we can assemble the real part of the green function. And let me just take this as a given. I haven't given you any workable model yet where this all comes out, but I will in a minute. Let's take this as a given. Let's just use the Kramers Kronig to construct the real part. Well, I simply go and do this integral. The numerator is entirely positive. It's the denominator which is changing sign. So this is changing sign from minus infinity to zero. Um, this is negative. From zero to infinity, it's positive. And hence, and you're adding both of them together. And if you're adding them together, the real part of the green function has to look like this. So intrinsic to what Mott was talking about, if these 
pole-like features here at low and high energies are in the same band is a zero crossing. Okay, and I'm going to be very precise about what I mean by this. Um, uh, it has to be that the determinant of the real part of the green function is equal to zero. And this is happening entirely within a single band. So this is, zeros are telling you, in this instance of zeros, are telling you about a strongly correlated gap system. And this makes sense. If the real part is equal to zero, it's telling you about an absence of propagation. Okay, so it's a breakdown of the particle concept. And there are several things that, that go along with the breakdown of the particle concept. It's that whole general slew of ideas that I call motness. Okay, now let's look at what Laughlin was talking about. He's saying that these bands are different because there's some sort of symmetry breaking. And if that's the case, we can write the green function like this. The determinant is just a product of these resolvents. This is never equal to zero. And uh, hence, there's no modness. And this is what Laughlin was talking about. Okay, so what we're after is a clear demonstration of all of these things Laughlin was complaining about. And I want to show you that there's a general way of thinking about such a model. And I think this also applies to what is going on in the Hubbard model. Now, speaking of the Hubbard model, one can go and do determinantal quantum Monte Carlo. And you see illustrated very, be very beautifully um, a two-band structure. The black region indicates a gap between them. This is the lower Hubbard band, upper Hubbard band. The green line is the non-interacting band structure. So this non-interacting band structure has bifurcated. At every momentum, there's spectral weight at low and high energies. Because of this, there will be zeros. Okay. This is so an now, afterling, Philip. Yes. Hello, yeah? Okay, okay, thanks. Okay. So the question I ask is, this is clearly in the Hubbard model, if you go and do determine out the Monte Carlo, and importantly, this is at a temperature bigger than anything having to do with antiferromagnetism. And that's what Mott was really interested in. That's why you get zeros. Okay, now, we can't go and solve this model. So the question I ask is, is the Hubbard model necessary? It's what we've all grown up with. We, we think we have to go and write down real space representations of this. Is it necessary? Um, and the answer is no. So what I want to do is focus on a separate question. If the answer to this question is no, why is it no? And is it no because there's a minimal model for Montness that has zeros, breakdown of particle concepts, in which you can enunciate exactly what the lower and upper Hubbard bands are. OK, to do that, I want to take a closer look at what we mean by a Fermi liquid. And I want to do this through the eyes of an extremely unknown paper of Anderson and Haldane that was written in 2000. And I'll show you how many citations the paper has. But let me tell you what's in the paper. It's an attempt to understand Fermi liquids from group theory. So a Fermi liquid is a state of matter in which if you were to add something here, this would renormalize to zero. OK, now in this renormalization to zero, you certainly might be renormalizing these things right here. But the key point is they're conserved currents. There are two of them, NP up, NP down. And there are four objects which go into these currents. And correctly noted, this means that the symmetry group is O4. O4 has two kinds of rotations, proper and improper rotations. The proper rotations are indicated by the subgroup uh, SO4. And the determinant of these, or the eigenvalues of these matrices, is equal to 1. Um, improper rotations mix the currents into their negatives, and they have determinant minus one. And because of this 
determinant one and minus one, these two things really don't talk to one another. And hence, there is an extra symmetry. There is a Z2 symmetry, which can be thought of as O4, the quotient of O4 with SO4. Okay. Now, what does this Z2 symmetry really do? Or what does it mean? How does it manifest itself? So their key point is that the real symmetry group is O4, and you need to look at, o, at SO4 and, and this Z2 symmetry. Now, this paper has received only two citations, uh, but it's been, and it's been gratefully, gratefully uh, influential in my thinking, um, but it's safe to say I don't think anyone knows about this paper. I think one of the citations is one by Phil Anderson and then uh, someone else. Okay, so let's look at a Fermi surface. The Fermi surface is demarcated by this equation. The dispersion equals epsilon f. And hence, at the Fermi surface, the Hamiltonian is equal to zero. The Hamiltonian is equal to zero. It's clearly invariant under the this extra transformation in O4. Namely, I can send NP up to minus NP up or just CP up to CP down. I mean, sorry, CP up to CP, CP up to CP up dagger. Uh, it's earlier for me. Um, and I don't change the sign here at all. So the Hamiltonian is equal to zero. It admits the symmetry. Well, this is exactly this improper rotation or this Z2 symmetry. And it's a property only of the electrons at the Fermi surface. Everywhere else, the symmetry is not apparent at all. So that was the real key point in this paper. There's an emergent Z2 symmetry that is extra that should be considered when you think about a Fermi surface or Fermi liquid. And at the Fermi surface, there is this emergent symmetry. So how do you destroy Fermi liquids? All you have to do is destroy this Z2 symmetry, which means you have to add something to the Hamiltonian, which is odd under this Z2 symmetry. Now, this Z2 symmetry is local in momentum space because the currents are NP up, NP down. So what do you have to add here? What is the minimal thing that you can add here which breaks this NP going to NP up going to minus NP up and NP down going to NP down. What is the minimal thing you need to add? Well, it's sort of obvious. It's not the Hubbard interaction. It's this interaction, which looks like the Hubbard interaction, but it's in momentum space. This is odd under Z2, and hence it breaks the Z2 symmetry. And it has a scaling dimension, which is minus two. This part of the Lagrange Hamiltonian has scaling dimension zero. And you're scaling towards the Fermi surface. So this means this is a relevant interaction. And that's how you get around this argument that uh, repulsive interactions don't change anything. This interaction is incredibly relevant, um, which means there has to be a new fixed point. And this is a group theory sort of derivation of the Hatsugai Komoto model, which is the model I want to go and treat. But this is a way of understanding it at a very high level that all you're really doing in this model is breaking a fundamental symmetry of a Fermi liquid. Okay, uh, so the other model is not... I have a quick clarification question. This is Rudro. Yes. Um, the Z2 symmetry, is this a unitary symmetry? How do I understand um, a, a number a quasi particle density becoming negative uh, in the transformation? Um, okay, so in O4, there are improper rotations. Right. So this is just part of the symmetry group O4. You're, it's entirely you're entirely allowed to do that. And it doesn't change anything about the spectrum because the Hamiltonian is zero right at the Fermi surface. I see. Okay, thank you. Okay. 
Okay, so there is a part of the Hubbard model which, in fact, um, ha has this dependence. Okay? Um, but so what I want to do right now is just explore this model. But we can understand it in terms of a big, uh, a bigger class of models which break Z2 symmetry. Okay, now, what's interesting is that in this page can and a half... I, uh, uh, Philip, can I seek a clarification? Uh, uh, O4 differs from SO4 by just having inversion. That's... Yes, yes. It's, 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 it's reflection, yes, yeah. Th that's I, the Z2. Okay. Yes. Yes, so yes, that's now, right. What I'm trying to understand is how uh, with this uh, uh, U term, you're going to break inversion. Is that what you're saying? That you have to yeah, break inversion? Is now, NP up going to minus NP up is not a symmetry of this Hamiltonian. I remember now, the Z2 okay. symmetry is you only you choose this? one of the curves. Question in relation to inversion, which we understand what that means. Right, so Z2 you can just view as a reflection. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so in two dimension, that's uh, the same thing as inversion. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So NP up goes to its negative, NP down just goes to its, just goes to the same thing. And this term does not respect that symmetry. So uh, is, is that like saying the uh, you you have to do this and change the sign of u? Yes, 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 yes. That's right. That's right. That's right. Please go on. Thank you. Okay. I think maybe Good. you're not talking about uh, rotation in the real space. I, I think Chandra may be thinking about real space because this symmetry is is for every p, right? You know, it's for every p yeah so this inversion is somehow in some abstract space we just yeah yeah, yeah 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 that's right that's right that's Maybe right that's the chinese right. uh, question yeah but then uh, i'm still a little bit confused so so your n your particle number can be negative so what does negative n means that that's like the previous question oh so at the fairly is, is it because a hole is it you, you become a hole yeah 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 it's it's a particle hole transformation that you've done for yeah. only one of the spins. Right. So n is measure respect to the fully occupied. Uh, I mean, it doesn't. The well, Fermi it, surface. It, yes. So, yeah. Yeah. Because it's that it's not the Fermi surface. Yes. That's right. So it's, it's respect to the full Fermi surface. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, so what I want to do is look at where one might construct how one might construct such a model. But the big, the bird's eye view is this symmetry. Okay, so this model was written down in 1992. And I think like uh, that Haldane Anderson paper, uh, this model was also uh, forgotten or not explored. And it's because of people like my good friend Subir that I began to look at this model because it turns out this model was written down the same year uh, that Subir wrote down a now famous model uh, which has some resonance with it. Um, if you add a term which looks like this, which has the center of mass constraint, and you're, you let everything interact, um, if you can do Fourier transforms in your head, you'll know why they introduced this model. Um, because this, if you don't make this substitution, the Fourier transform of this is exactly this. So this rather non-local, this model which has non-local interactions, I won't yet say the model is non-local, I'll tell you what I mean by that. This model, which has these non-local interactions, Fourier transform directly into this. Okay. Now, um, what about the correlations in this model? Because of this delta function constraint, uh, sorry, because of the center of mass constraint, um, the correlators in this model are, they die off very quickly. So there is a sense of locality, although there are non-local interactions in the model. 
Okay, the general HK model is one in which you have NK up, NK prime down. These don't have to be the same. As long as you're just summing over one or two momenta, this term will always be relevant relative to this term over here, which is just a pure kinetic energy. Okay, so in this model, you have a commutation relationship between uh, the interaction and the kinetic energy, which is zero. Now, you wouldn't think any non-trivial physics would come from such a model, but it does. Okay, it has a solvable mod transition. The green function has exactly this bifurcated structure. It's a sum of two poles with different weights that depend on the occupancy. So if, it, if this pole depends on the occupancy, and this one up here does, it tells you that at any filling, you have to sum over all energies just to get the, the, the weight of one for each k-state. This will is the lower band, and this here is the upper band. Okay, now, given that we say this is lower and upper, um, we should be able to construct exactly what we mean by the operators that generate this. So it helps then to think about this in momentum space. And this is just really the momentum space analog of Hubbard operators. So <clears throat> you can consider just adding and subtracting this piece. I'm going to call this zeta and this eta. And the spectrum is completely diagonalizable in terms of zeta and eta. If you look at n equals one half, the green function looks like this. It no longer has a simple pole. It has this overall structure now, which is changing everything. And you can think about this as the self-energy, although strictly speaking, it is not because um, this thing diverges. And hence, self-energies typically you can derive from perturbation theory. This you cannot. And this, because this quantity can be infinity, this green function will in fact vanish. And because it does, you'll be destroying the quasi-particles in a Fermi liquid. Okay, so it has a mod transition. And I just wanted to find W to be the width of the non-interacting band. And this is what it looks like. This is the lower band. This is the upper band. I'm just plotting those dispersions that come out from the green function. And this surface here is the zero surface. Okay, so uh, since these are symmetrically located around the chemical potential, the zero surface has to be right in the middle. Now you can change all of this by simply letting u be less than w. This band will drop below the chemical potential. And you have three kinds of occupancies. Uh, Philip, can I question? You don't mind? Uh, are you assuming that nk is independent of k? No, no, it's very much dependent on k. Uh, well, uh, so it's very much dependent on k, okay? He, he, here is the dependence. That's what these numbers are, okay? In, here is the dependence. In this region, nk is zero. In this region, it's 0.5. In this region, it's one. Okay? So okay. this is now the, 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 the empty part. Only over the singly occupied part of the spectrum do you see a zero surface? Okay, and so this part here now dips below. This is now the doubly occupied part of the spectrum. This is the empty part. So by singly occupied, you mean NK up or NK down or some average of the two or what? It's any, it's, um, since you have to have SU2 symmetry, it's all possible, com uh, it's all possible, uh, values of the spin such that you preserve that. So there's a huge so spin. You have an entropy then. You have an entropy? Yeah, right. Okay. There's a huge spin degeneracy here in the metal. All right, thank you. Yes, yes, yes. 
Okay. So um, now I want to get back to this Lottinger theorem. Okay, so this just shows what Subira was asking about. Uh, here is nk as a function of momentum. It goes from zero in this region, here it's one, and here it's two. Okay, the total occupant, the, the total density should just be the integrated weight under here. Now, what I want to do is ask the question, can I obtain this total integrated weight by simply looking at the sign changes of the green function? Okay, let's, okay. So here I have a positive sign and I have to change sign across here. And so here are the sign changes. And if I add up this weight here and here, this part I can put here, and you can see it's identically equal to the total density in the system. And hence the Luttinger count, which counts the sign changes, is identically equal to the, the average density. Okay, now let's go to the dope case. In the dope case, we have a metal, and n is now less than 1, um, this part drops below. Note, the place where you have single occupancy is not evenly split between up between above and below the chemical up below and above the chemical potential. Okay, and the fact that this now has dropped down here tells you you have spectral weight transfer in the model, which of course it has to have since these bands, you have to sum over both of them to get the fact that you have unity for the um for this for the uh, weight. Okay, and now the plus and minus part looks like this. Now it's fairly obvious that the sum of these pluses does not equal what would happen if you were to put this, re this part in here. So you have a violation of the Luttinger count, which means there isn't a one-to-one -one mapping between anything that looks like a quasi-particle and what is going on in this problem. Okay, now, um, so what we did is simply plotted the full phase space of this model, since we can solve it exactly, of where the occupancy, um, when the, of where the Luttinger count is not equal to the average density. And for almost all system parameters, there is no correspondence between the two. And hence, in general, the system is a non-Fermi liquid. Now, we should be able to, since it's a simple model, state exactly why it is a non-Fermi liquid. Okay, remember the key thing about Fermi liquids. All of the excited states are just adiabatically continuable to things which came from the non-interacting system. The excited states here, you have single occupancy, you have double occupancy. Okay, in, the, in a Fermi liquid, you just have zero and two. Okay, now let's look at what's going on in the HK model. Um, we have the ground state, and then you create the singly occupied part by operating this lower band operator on the ground state. So this part is just fine. These two stand in a one-to-one -one correspondence. And if it does, then it seems we're, we're fine so far. It seems like a Fermi liquid. But the problem is there is no corresponding state like this that can be created from these operators because this combination is equal to zero. And that's why it's a non-Fermi liquid. There are states here which are not present over here. This state, in fact, has gone up to high energy. Okay, now one might ask the question, and you can certainly ask me about this later. I have a slide with, which illustrates this, but I just want to sort of be more streamlined. Um, right. Uh, is this an EFL, as you will hear about tomorrow? Okay, so. Uh, question, uh, Philip. Uh, you, you, you're implying that in this story, uh, a. 
the the metal um, and therefore the transition necessarily uh, violates Latinger's theorem. Is that what? Yes, you're saying? yes, yes, yes. Yes, okay. that's right. So that, that's an old story because the Green's function that you wrote down was the Hubbard first decoupling approximation on the Hubbard model, and uh, and as lots of people pointed out immediately in your theorem and therefore the whole Hubbard approximation for question. This is a story from the 1960s uh, that Herring emphasized. Now, uh, th there is one particular thing that you have done in all of this, which is that you have insisted on having poles, simple poles. Uh, if you have, if you allowed the possibility of branch cuts, some uh, with, with arbitrary exponents, uh, you would have the freedom not to break the Luttinger theorem. Okay, so I'm solving a particular model, and this model has occupancy zero, one, and two. And the thing, the fact that it has one, as opposed to zero or two, is sufficient to make this a non-Fermi liquid. I'm not solving any other model. I'm and just wondering if the model is thick. Um, it's um, no, I don't think so. Um, the if you were, for example, if your statement is that you can only generate violations of Luttinger's theorem by models which have uh, algebra, which have um, sort of power law type singularities, that same is not correct. If you look at the simulations on the Hubbard model, you certainly see that. Okay, now, the fact that we have a two pole structure, um, and that that is also present in Hubbard one is irrelevant, because this is the exact green function for this model. Well, you have to look near mu, not the broad structure. Well, I'm saying it, this is computed by looking at the behavior near mu by omega equals zero. Now, I haven't insisted on putting poles. That's the solution to the green function. So a simple way of generating a, a non-Fermi liquid is just to bifurcate the spectrum into two pieces. You can do it with power laws if you want, but that's not what is in this model. Okay, so this model uh, just breaks the Z2 symmetry um, by, um, as it's based just on this sort of term in which is local in momentum space. And this interaction is much more relevant than the general sort of four fermion interaction that you would write down, which is four momenta. This has just one, and hence it has scaling dimension minus two. So we can understand this in general as there is a universality class of models which breaks this Z2 symmetry, and certainly part of the Hubbard interaction does that, and that's the part that is, gener that is, that is, that is giving rise to this gap structure. Okay, now, the similarity to Hubbard, HK. Um, here is the spectrum of the Hubbard model at U equals 12, and this is the spectrum of the HK model. At eight, at, this is exact diagonalization at U equals 12. And com, as you go between here and here, there are some differences, but the overall features are not so different. And that's because this, um, this captures, I mean, this, the two are in the same universality class. Now, when you go away from uh, N equals one, you begin to see differences. And for example, uh, here is Hubbard at U equals 12. Note, this thing has gone down from here and it's transferred the spectral weight to the lower band. That's because the Hubbard model has dynamical spectral weight transfer. Dynamical spectral weight transfers is not present in the HK model. And that's what the HK model does that the Hubbard model does not do. It separates the mechanism from the gap from the stuff that makes the Hubbard model completely intractable. If you look at the number of empty sites, 
um, you find that it's not a conserved quantity. And that's because the dynamics can generate, can mix the two bands. That mixing is absent in, this, in the HK model. And as a result, um, there, are, there are effects here which are not in the HK model, but this physics is on a smaller order. It's like T over U type corrections. And, um, and hence, um, in terms of defining what motness is, um, this is a small correction. Okay, so here we go. Um, we started with the Fermi, li Fermi gas, Fermi liquid, BCS superconductor. Um, we now have a new model. And so the terminus of this evolution is motness. And um, the key thing here is the singly occupied part. So now what I want to do is ask the question, since we have an exactly solvable model, can we ask the question of Cooper and address the issue of superconductivity the same way that it was addressed for Fermi liquid? So let's look at the Cooper instability. We simply turn on this interaction and uh, we go and compute. Um, we simply put a pair above the chemical potential and we compute this energy. And we hope this quantity is negative. It's a very simple equation that you're supposed to solve. And um, uh, since we're summing over the unoccupied region, this equation just reduces to this. So it's very similar um, to the BCS type of instability. And in fact, you can show that there is a Cooper instability. And this is an, an, an approximate expression. I just wanted to, you to, to illustrate this. This is just in the limit in which u over w is less than one. Okay. And you see this quantity is in fact uh, negative because if you're plotting the, 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 the negative, the positive. Uh, solution here. Okay. Okay. Now, what is interesting is that you can go beyond just the Cooper instability. You can actually go and calculate the full pair susceptibility in this model. And um, one can do that because of the structure of how this thing separate Hamiltonian separates in K-space. And um, it just reduces to this. Chi zero is the susceptibility in the absence of when G is equal to zero. It has a standard logarithmic uh, logarithmic singularity and you can just solve for that when it's equal to one and you can, you can define tc so tc is right here and here we've just plotted the band structure for the non-interacting system here so these peaks are somehow related to these things okay and here's the form for tc so we know the ground state with this interaction is a superconductor so that means we can go and do exactly what BCS did. Now, the power of BCS is they wrote down a variational wave function. And from that, they're able to go and calculate everything. We can do the same thing here in this toy model for a Mott insulator or a dope Mott insulator. Now, the power of BCS is that this wave function doesn't only describe the superconducting state, it also describes the non-interacting state. And it does because you have two parameters. This will give you the unoccupied. This will give you the doubly occupied part. But what are we trying to dis Okay, so before I get to how you can modify this, let me just play a little game. If you just take this wave function and only make the product over K positive, it actually admits this structure. So, but these three coefficients are related. This will be the doubly occupied, empty, and this is now the singly occupied part, which is what we need to get everything right in this for the, for the non-interacting system. Okay, so that's what we're trying to model. So we have to have at least three parameters. So we chose a trial wave function, which looked like this. This part would describe the empty part that the doubly occupied part and this the singly occupied part that's and the, then we just turn what is b what is b of k is it a electron operator it's a pair operator it's, it's a pair operator 
It's, remember, this so is the wave B, function. B is C dagger up, C dagger down. It's C dagger up, C, C K up dagger, C minus K down dagger. So B is like a Cooper pair. Yeah, 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 yeah. Singlet. So, so, so why why are you saying that this is singlet? Uh, because this in it, this puts this doesn't doubly occupy each momentum space K. Oh, I see. Okay, <laughs> that's that's that, that's just a. It, let, let me just go back to. Oh, right. So remember, if you can write the BCS wave function as a product over k greater than zero, and you have exactly these three these three terms. But here okay. I want to make them now independent. In BCS, they're related. Okay. A H K, they're completely unrelated. So you have a much more complicated variational problem you have to go and solve. But we solved that problem. Okay, but, but your ground state still has a huge uh, spin degeneracy, right? Not in the superconducting state. Mm -hmm. Okay, that it's broken there. Yes, yes. But, but the state that you wrote down before has this spin degeneracy. Has this yeah, if, if g is equal to zero. What is g? G is, g is the coupling constant for the the for the the uh, for the attraction oh so you added a term to make this an yeah th that's how we got I, okay. I showed you you had yeah. Not by me. yeah i didn't okay so you added an attractive term yeah added an attractive term because i'm interested in carrying out the HK. cooper okay. yeah you added a term to the hk model okay yeah 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 and i showed that when you do that you can still go and calculate the cooper instability exactly you can get out the superconducting susceptibility and hence this motivates then looking at a wave function to go okay. and do all this is no longer exact instead. this state is no longer exact no it's it's not, right 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 okay. it's no longer exact. Sure. yeah yes yes absolutely okay it's it's the analogous <clears throat> thing that you would do but it's the right and, and and it's not exact for a very particular reason when you add the um the pair term you've destroyed the commutativity of the of the two terms in the Hamiltonian yeah. okay and, and that has certain consequences yeah, yeah. okay okay so you have three very variational parameters now it's a more difficult problem um you can go and compute the average energy vary all of these things and the key thing that comes out of all of that is you can define a gap and this is the form for the gap in the limit w is bigger than u and we have our first result. TC looks like this. Delta looks like this. Uh, in the limit, the G goes to zero. Since these have different exponents, this ratio is now not a universal number. In fact, it's a very large number. In fact, in the strictly in the in the in the G equals zero limit, uh, which is what is relevant for BCS, it's infinity. So this is non-BCS superconductivity. Okay. Now, the key thing about BCS is they were not only able to write down the ground state, I mean, for the superconducting state, they also wrote down the excited states. Now, there are no quasi particles in the uh, in the ground state uh, BCS wave function. So one can construct what these are by simply finding an operator that annihilates the BCS state. And that is a linear combination of a hole and a particle weighted by the spin. Okay, now this program doesn't work for this because any of the excitations in this system are not linear combinations of particles and holes. Okay, so the Bogolubov quasi-particle scheme does not work. There are a new set of excitations here, which are the excited states. And we call these pions um, based on the, our initials, uh, how they appeared on the paper. And here, here's what they are. There are two of them for the upper and the lower band. And they're now in terms of composite operators. And they're still weighted by spin. You still have these coherence factors coming in. 
but they're fundamentally distinct objects. Okay, now that we have these, um, and you can see that in fact, this does annihilate this, and you can confirm that it does give rise to a gap spectrum by going and seeing that this does in fact um, gap out these degrees of freedom. And this gap is precisely the thing we went and computed previously by this variation of the ground state energy with respect to these three parameters. So it's completely consistent. Okay. Now the key thing here is superconductivity is affecting both bands. It's affecting something at high energies and at low energies. Okay, so this is what the B, this is what BCS looks like. You produce a gap, and the intensity below here and above here, positive and negative energies, is identical. That's not the case here. As you can see, the spectral weight is different. And it's because extra degrees of freedom are now lying up here. And you can get more complicated than that um, if, if you were to look at um, uh, super, inducing superconductivity in the metallic state at half filling. All of these bands are just these pion bands. Okay, there's one for uh, at high and at low energies, okay, and the and the and the intensities do differ. Okay, now one of the things which I have been which has always been in the back of my mind is this color change um, that was noticed by Van der Marle's group quite some time ago. And the color change is that if you look at the integrated spectral weight from zero to some cutoff and from that cutoff up to the top of the, uh, the upper Hubbard band, um, what you find is that there's an exchange of spectral weight. So this thing goes up. This is the lower part, has an in accelerated increase. This thing goes down. And this change is very subtle. It's not a big change. The increase here over what it was before is just 3%. And so why should I worry about 3%? Well, the experimentalists said you should worry about it. They said it's not a big change, but it's large enough to account for the condensation energy in these compounds. So when superconductivity obtains, there's a transfer of spectral weight from the high energy part to the low energy part. Okay, and as far as I can see, no one's been able to explain that. Now we have all the ingredients to be able to explain that because we have gapping out of degrees of freedom, both high and low energies. Okay, so this total weight here will, is what we're going to compute and we're going to compute that relative to its value when g is equal to zero. Okay, and um, the key thing here is that this quantity is positive. Sorry, it's bigger than one. And um, for, right, bigger than one. And if you look at what it is, you know, in this region right here, it's, it's not bad. It's roughly on the order of what you see experimentally. It's not a huge effect. And it's happening. And you can see exactly why it's happening. As you increase u over t, this thing is going down, which means it's a dynamical effect. It's coming about because in the presence of this pair term, the Hamiltonian, the, the, the kinetic and the interaction parts no longer commute. You've mixed them. The operators now which diagonalize the problem are no longer these band Hubbard operators. And as a result, there is a uh, there is dynamical spectral weight transfer. And um, what we're advocating is that we can't solve every model in this universality class that's breaks Z2, but it seems as if it's not an unreasonable uh, statement that this mixing is coming because of dynamical spectral weight transfer. Okay, so we can't answer this question, but we're proposing that this might be the general reason. Okay, now the last thing that we can compute, although we have a program right now to go and compute everything that BCS did, you know, ultrasonic attenuation, because it's just combining these coherence factors uh, differently, we can get the superfluid density. Now, in a Fermi liquid, 
the superfluid density just looks like this. It's peaked at n equals 1. It, it has to be peaked there. It has to be peaked somewhere because here you have no density. Here you have an insulator. So it has to be peaked in the middle. Okay. We can't have a peak in the middle because the system is a mod insulator, right, at n equals 1. So you know exactly what the answer has to be. This is what the superfluid density looks like in the dope mod insulator. It's suppressed in the vicinity of the mod insulator. And look at the suppression of the spectral, uh, see, of the superfluid density um, close to, to this point, relative to the uh, BCS value. And this is modness induced suppression um, of the superfluid density. So it has several ingredients um, which are telling you that even in the superconducting state, what is mot about the problem still survives. And um, hence, this seems like it's, t it's telling us something that should apply in general. Okay, to summarize, um, <clears throat> you can describe motness certainly with the Hubbard model. You aren't going to get very far. The HK model allows you to make precise statements. Um, both of them, the part of Hubbard and HK, which overlap, is that they both break this Z2 symmetry. Um, you, we find that there are pion excitations, non-BCS superconductivity, and a violation of Luttinger's theorem in general. Okay. Um, thank you. That's what I wanted to say. Uh, sucks, Philip. Can I uh, make a some comment? Sure. Yeah. I just just a general comment. I just want to remind people that you know, of course, exactly soluble water is, is very useful, but there's a big price to pay. Uh, to me, the the important thing about the mod insulator is the local moment formation, and that's entirely absent here. In, in this model, there's no sign of any local moment. There's a huge uh, ground state degeneracy, which uh, puts the BCS, the pairing state uh, breaks. But I think that's missing a very important part of the physics of any realistic model. Uh, so I would say that uh, I, this model is in, in, in some sense very sick. Um, you know, you, you can get some mileage out of it because it's exactly soluble, but uh, I wouldn't even begin to think about comparing any conclusion with experiment. I mean, I think it illustrates the point that, you know, I think you set up the point nicely that, you know, you uh, about this uh, Luttinger theorem and uh, zero crossing and so on. I mean, it, it, it does serve some purpose, but uh, I think the absence of local moment is a very, uh, it's a big uh, drawback. You're certainly entitled to that opinion. Um, I would say that in terms yeah, in terms of the spin physics, it certainly doesn't get that right. But remember, the local moments are coming about because of this large interaction. It's right. it, remember, it's localized. Um, this localization is coming about because of monotonous. Yeah. Yes, and, and and that's to me is the essence of I mean, the, the essence of this problem is really the uh, tension between real space and momentum space. You know, the, <clears throat> the kinetic term is written in momentum space. The interaction is in real space. So you turn the problem around, you put everything in momentum space, and that's what makes it soluble. But at the same time, you've given up the core of the uh, physics. I, I don't think so, because if you look at what's going on in the, if you look at, Patrick, um, uh, if we look at the statements which are precise, let's say that determinantal quantum Monte Carlo is precise. We have an upper band and a lower band. Okay, so the spectral weight is split in two. Yeah. Okay, and the, the, the question is, how does that affect the overall physics? And at that, at that temperature, there is no evidence of any ordering of any kind. So I would say that in terms of um, separating, the problem with the Hubbard model is that it combines everything together. What this does is say, if you want to understand what is the non-trivial physics that's coming about because you've bifurcated the spectral weight, you can understand that. 
if you now want to complicate it by putting in um, all of the things which come about from the non-commutativity, you can do that. In fact, what you can do is this. You can, in, to go from HK to Hubbard, if you just Fourier transform the Hubbard interaction, you can see that the part that is thrown away is certain momentum structure. You can systematically put that back in and do simulations on the intermediate models. And you can see exactly how all of the structure that you um, that is in the in the full Hubbard model is coming about. If you just include a mixing at pi pi, you can get pretty much the same spectral function for the Hubbard model. Philip, I would compare with the uh, one aspect of experiments. Um, one can do uh, angle resolved photo emission in the Mott insulating state. Right. And, and you will find, and so that is measuring particle occupation for different Ks and uh, as a function of energy. And right. you will never find that the occupation is integer at a given K. In, in, a, in, a, in a given restricted range of omega. And I would also, uh, although I'm not quite sure, I was trying to do it in my head, I would, I would try to calculate the specific heat and entropy of the model. And uh, my guess, uh, it's just a guess at this point, is that you will find that uh, it doesn't respect some physics. Okay, so um, let me just respond to your first statement. Um, we, so are you saying that the occupancy is less than one? Because, um, Chandra, what is your statement? What you have to do to get unit spectral weight in any MOT model is integrate uh, from, you know, from the lower band into the upper band at any particular momentum, then you'll get one. Okay, so um, the thing I drew this is just a cartoon. But what I'm saying is that the singly occupied part doesn't have a weight of one unless you integrate up to the upper band. Okay, now your second comment about the, about the specific heat, we've calculated that. And in the BCS, sorry, in the superconducting state, it looks exactly the way it's supposed to. Okay, now in terms of the model, yes, it has non-local interactions. Uh, if you want to criticize it, well, you know, there are lots of people in the Zoom who have been working on other models which are non-local, um, which have non-local interactions. You also have this problem of the uh, of of an entropy um, that hasn't stopped that community from prospering, um, given that no one's made any precise statement about superconductivity in adult mod insulator. I think Patrick's comment is misguided. Because if you want to focus on local moments, you never get anywhere. And what this tells you is, if you focus on models, which are classified in terms of breaking a Z2 symmetry, you can get somewhere. I, I think what you're saying is Hubbard model is hard. Okay, so th 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 there's nothing in the world that is designed to make things uh, easy for you. Right? I mean, that's not a... What I'm trying to say is that it's hard in a particular way. It doesn't make it right. And what HK shows is how it is hard. And if you, were, if, you throw the, if you flip the problem on its head and work in momentum space and work backwards, you can actually get somewhere. Because that's what Haldane and Anderson actually told us we should do. And what's interesting is in their paper when they said, yeah, to break the Z2 symmetry, you need to add something that has N up and down. They didn't have any indices on that. They didn't have anything in momentum space or in real space. 
because they knew that really what you would have to do is put something in momentum space because it's the currents that are conserved in momentum space. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, I think we can uh, move on and uh, let other people ask questions. Uh, so I think someone uh, raise <clears throat> his hand. I, I uh, Adrian, a, uh, yeah, you, you can ask the question. I have a more pedestrian question, which is um, <clears throat> the T, the formulas you showed for TC, you had the bandwidth larger than U. Is that right? Yeah, double right. 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 Yes, so that was, was yes. Yes. So we're sort of in a <coughs> you're sort of in a weak link. Okay, okay, okay. So what I did is I just wanted to show you an expression that you can uh, reduce from the full thing to um, something that I could write down on a slide. The more exact expression you can get out, and it's not... yes. Is there a question? Yeah, and you can get that out for you, for any value of u and w. Okay, I just didn't write it down. Okay, thank you. Can I maybe ask a question? Uh, going back to the beginning of your story, uh, uh, in 2003, there was a paper by Igor Zelashinsky in PRB with uh, yes, type yes. uh, large liquids and... Uh, non uh lachinger surface in non-fermi liquid in mod insulators when right. he uh, discussed just that zeros of uh, the in function not only poles but zeros yes can you yes. tell me what the relation of uh, your approach is right. what, uh, okay. Look, that th that i think is a brilliant paper because it's the first time anyone really said that if you have this mod mechanism you have to have a zero crossing and so since I read that paper, I've been trying to come up with models which illustrate this. And um, so, yeah, this is the simplest model which has that. Now, there are versions of zeros which have made it into the mainstream, which are non which are non Hamiltonian based. For example, the YRZ green function is just an implementation of the Zielashinsky program um, in which it's artificially maintained that at the non-interacting Brillouin, at the Brillouin zone for the uh, half fill, for the, for the non-interacting system, um, the zero surface just remains invariant throughout any doping. Okay, so, but what's interesting is this model has exactly that structure for the self energy um, with a certain sign difference, but it is the exact version of essentially what they were talking about. But it does go back to this Gielosinski paper. He didn't have any models there, but he just knew that if in fact the spectral weight bifurcates into two and you don't form new bands, the spectrum, you have to have a zero of the real part of the green function. Very good. <clears throat> Is anyone going to ask about the relationship to EFL, which you will hear about tomorrow? Uh, actually, it's not a tomorrow. Uh, so Santa's talk was uh, rescheduled to next week. Oh, okay. Yeah, but maybe let me ask. So what's the relation with the EFL? <laughs> okay. Thank you for asking that question. Completely unprompted. Um, so that paper I've been studying a lot. Okay, so what's the relationship between HK and EFL? Okay. Now, um, what they have said, so the, the change in occupancy at every at any k state but to get this one you have to integrate over the whole band or over from the lower to upper so photo emission will never just get one okay to answer chandra's question the change in the occupancy per k state is always one going from here to here to here okay 
Now, what is the statement of EFL is the following that one can formulate the density by summing over all the distinct regions and you organize this information in terms of an anomaly coefficient. And this anomaly coefficient should be two for a spinful Fermi liquid slash EFL. So our anomaly coefficient should be two. Now, in a later part of the paper, they say something which is directly translatable into this. They said, look, ultimately what they're saying is that you can get Luttinger's theorem right if you just assign a bunch of numbers to every K state in the Brillouin zone. And you just sum over all of those uh, K points, okay? But there is something that you have to keep in mind. The difference in the occupancy is set by this anomaly coefficient. Okay, so in this case, M should be two. Now, the e, this HK model has this difference equals one. So we thought in, initially that it was an example of an EFL, um, but as far as I can tell, we have not been able to get this counting argument right if in fact the change in the occupancy is equal to this anomaly coefficient, which should be two. So that's as far as we got with that. I let me just comment. I said something in the chat. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I've only heard your work just now, so I can't really comment on what on the details of what you're doing. But uh, words like anomaly and so on, which of course appear in our paper, uh, you know, we have. It's really restricted to situations in which the model is local in real space, right? So I'm not sure that any of those considerations can be taken to describe models with these infinite range interactions that you have. So uh, that's my only comment. Okay, let me ask you, uh, thanks for th that comment. Yeah, we've been struggling with this and I've you know tried to map it on because initially I thought it worked because of the statement, but then we saw it was restricted to this. So do you think that you have implicitly included an extra this extra Z2 symmetry that Haldane and Anderson were talking about in your EFL? No, we make no such assumption. OK, so then let me ask you a question. The Katz-Moody algebra that you write down particularly is telling you that your occupancies can't be thought of simply. I mean, meaning that they aren't just any sort of Fox space type of um, numbers. It's, it's something that is coming about because you, you actually have a vacuum, which is sort of non-trivial. Um, but nonetheless, when you apply this to, but when you include spin, all you do is multiply, you just have an extra factor of two, which means that it seems like you're explicitly excluding a case in which when you go to the spinful case, you're getting some region which has ones. So, so, so let me just say something, devoid of where this came from, okay? Is it possible for something which looks like this to be an EFL, regardless of the model it came from? Uh, I, I don't know, not according to the statements in our paper, but uh, uh, yeah. Okay. Okay, we should continue talking. Um, you know, I've talked to Dominic about this extensively and um, so we're trying to bridge what we did to what you did. If, if there is a bridge, might be it's a bridge too far, I don't know. Maybe infinitely far because it's infinitely non-local. <laughs> okay, uh, is there any other question? 
Uh, yeah, I'd like to ask a question. Uh, sure. Um, Please. Th thanks for the nice talk. Uh, yep. Yeah, I wanted to ask something about something you said in the beginning where you looked at this perturbation around a Fermi liquid that was like this NN interaction. Right. Um, you said it was relevant. Uh, it looks marginal, say in 1D, it is one of these Luttinger parameters. So is okay. it like marginally relevant? No, 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 no. Um, so if you just go, so you just go and do the Polchinski RG. So you make sure the kinetic term has scaling dimension zero. And then what Polchins, what the interaction term that Polchinski had, it had four different four different integrals over momentum. Okay, each of those will carry a factor of s. In this case, there's only one such integral. Okay, because all the fermion operators have this carry the same momentum. And then from the time you'll get s to the minus one, and just go and count, you'll just go and count this. It has scaling dimension minus two. I see. Okay. okay. Now, if you go to the nk nk prime interaction, that because now you have two integrals over momentum, that has scaling dimension minus one. So there are a whole general class of interactions which are much more relevant. Which is why I think the, the way to proceed with this is to start building in now further uh, momentum corrections to this. And then what you'll see is you'll go from things which are hugely relevant to things which become marginal or irrelevant as you go to the full stuff that's in the Hubbard model. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other question? Uh, okay, if not, uh, uh, let's thank Philip again for a very great talk. Philip, thanks. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. And uh, I will now have breakfast. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks. See you. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.